Well, let me pick up right where I left off since I was rudely interrupted by the computer freezing up. So we were talking about an animal biting. So at the site of the bite, the virus replicates. It moves up, back up through your peripheral nervous system, and that's going to be a retrograde activity. I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, it continues replicating. It moves closer and closer to the uh, brain. Eventually it gets to the brain, and it's going to infect the brain, causing all kinds of massive neurological damage. Um, the virus then will tra travel um, anterograde, so it'll travel down your nerves, and it'll get into things like your eyes, your kidneys, and specifically your salivary glands, so that if you go and bite people, you can infect them as well. So as we were looking at, you do have retrograde transport through the axon, and you have anterior grade transport through the axon, and this allows for, um, for information to be sent from the cell body to the, um, to the axon and from the axon back to the cell body. So this is just a different view of a neuron for you, for you to look at, and you can practice this one. You can see the cell body, the dendrites, you can see the nucleus, and uh, you can see that this particular cell has a nucleolus. That's an area that actively makes more ribosomes. You can see that there is an axonal hillock, or axon hillock, which is this narrowing down of the cell body to make um, the axon coming down. So we can see the axon. This particular axon has Schwann cells to it, which provide um, you know, insulation. There are little gaps in the insulation called nodes of Ranvier, and eventually we end at the axon terminals. So looking at that insulation, um, the Schwann cell is kind of an interesting cell. Uh, this is a cell that's found in the nerves of your peripheral nervous system. And uh, as that cell develops, it basically wraps itself around and around and around and around the cell. So you can see on the outside there's a nucleus there. But as it wraps around, it creates layers of this, of this membrane. And that membrane is a fatty material. So it's providing insulation. You'll see what the insulation does in just uh, a little bit. And you can see the insulation. This is an electron micrograph showing you all the, um, the layers. You can see the layers of it. And this would be the axon. So this is the axon right here. And then the Schwann cell is wrapped around it. Now that myelin sheath is really important. And uh, it's produced in the peripheral nervous system by what we call Schwann cells. And it's produced, this, this myelin sheath is produced by oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. And uh, this just shows you that wrapping process I just described to you. So the Schwann cell initially develops, touches the axon, and then it begins to wrap around it and wrap around it and wrap around it. So it provides, uh, you know, uh, impenetrable layer uh, around the axon, except at the nodes of Ranvier. Now, in multiple sclerosis, we have an autoimmune reaction where you produce antibodies, we think, and those antibodies eventually destroy the um, uh, so your immune system literally destroys the uh, myelin sheath, leaving an axon bare of myelin sheath. And when that happens, you have a, a disruption in the normal way that the that the nerve cells are working. There is a little video I have that you can look at on multiple sclerosis. Uh, it is a, a relatively common condition of the nervous system. And, uh, you know, I know multiple people, really deep, good friends that have multiple sclerosis. So it's a, it's a common problem and uh, something you should be aware of and know a little something about. So watch that video and you can learn a little bit more about it. So we do have structural classifications of neurons. So there are some neurons that are uh, an anaxonic, where they appear to have no axon to them. There are some nerve cells, cells that we call bipolar, where the cell body, on one side we have dendrites coming in, the axon going out. We have unipolar, where we have the cell body kind of hangs off to the side, and we have dendrites and axons that, uh, that uh, connect to the cell body, but from a side, um, a side connection. And then we have multipolar neurons. These are neurons that have more than two processes. There may be a single axon, and in this example, a single axon, and then there are multiple dendrites connecting to the cell body. 
Okay, so structurally we have different uh, classifications of neurons. These are found in different locations in the body and they do different jobs. Neurons sometimes though are classified based on the scientists that found them. So here we have uh, Purkinje, named after the person that just first described them. And then sometimes they're classified based on shape. So we have the pyramidal is uh, almost a pyramid-like shape that you can see there. All right, let's talk about those really important neuroglial cells. So neuroglial cells have many different functions. They provide support and structural framework for the muscle cell. They fill in spaces. They produce myelin or the insulation. And they carry out phagocytosis, which is a process that where they eat cellular debris and microorganisms that might find themselves in nerve tissue. Uh, and they have a, other functions as well. I'll talk about one other function, which is the creation of um, cerebral spinal fluid. So here are astrocytes. You can see the astrocyte here is, uh, I guess, astro refers to star. So I, I guess to somebody that looks like a star-shaped cell. And uh, astrocytes are going to form uh, a structural support between the capillaries and the brain. So if you see, this is a capillary right here. And this is the astrocyte. The astrocyte literally covers all the capillaries that are in the brain, and it forms this thing called the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a barrier that does not allow all things to come into the brain. Um, it is a protective mechanism. So if there are certain kinds of uh, chemicals, poisons, and things that are in the bloodstream, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to end up in the nerve tissue. Um, this makes given people with brain cancer, um, it makes it a problem because you can't really uh, give all chemotherapy um, units um, to people that have brain cancer because the chemotherapy oftentimes won't make it through the blood-brain barrier. You can see that this is a, a barrier that prevents uh, a lot of things in. The astrocytes, too, are going to in, uh, be involved in, um, in regulating blood flow to the brain. So they can constrict the blood vessels and regulate how much blood is going to the to the um, certain parts of the brain. So there's a there's a tremendous role. You can see also the the astrocytes extend out and they will um, they will uh, uh, support the framework of the nerve tissue so that the nerve nerve cells don't collapse uh, in on themselves. We also have microglial cells. Microglial cells are going to support and carry out phagocytosis. So these particular microglial cells are going to eat cellular debris. You know, anytime a nerve cell dies inside the brain cell, it has to be eat, uh, inside the brain. It has to be eaten up, and neuroglial cells will do that job. If you do get a brain infection, neuroglial cells uh, are one of your lines of defense against um, the microorganisms growing in your brain. We have ependymal cells too. The ependymal cells are um, these cells that line fluid-filled cavities inside the brain, and uh, they are going to make uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Cerebral spinal fluid is also known as CSF, and this is a fluid that uh, feeds uh, parts of the brain, it nourishes the brain, and it uh, provides a shock-absorbing fluid in some of those cavities of the brain. The cerebral spinal fluid is circulated uh, by the uh, by the uh, pendimal cells, they have extensions there, cilia that help to uh, to move the fluids uh, back and forth. And uh, the ependymal cells are going to be in the ventricles of the brain and the central canal of the spinal cord. These are parts we'll talk more about when we get into the um, into the structure of the central nervous system and uh, spinal cord. Cerebral spinal fluid is important. You can do a spinal tap on a human and draw out cerebral spinal fluid and check to see if there's bacteria or viruses that are in it. So it's one way that we can check um, if you have a brain infection or a spinal cord infection uh, without having to open up the brain or spinal cord. So we just stick a needle right into the central canal of the spinal cord, draw off some fluid, and then we can culture it to see what's growing in it. Oligodendrocytes are going to be the cells that provide myelin or the insulation for neurons that are in the brain and spinal cord. Um, so you can see they wrap around, very similar to what Schwann cells did. They wrap around the axon to cr create that uh, insulation. 
So there are a few neuroglial cells that are found specifically in the peripheral nervous system. That would be your nerves coming out of the brain and spinal cord. The nerves um, are, are going to have um, Schwann cells wrapping around their axons for, my, uh, for the myelin or insulation. And uh, there are also satellite cells that are around some of the cells of the uh, of the uh, peripheral nervous system. And these satellite cells are going to act very similar to, um, to what astrocytes do, uh, creating structural support for the nerve cells in the peripheral nervous system. All right, well, this puts us to our physiology that we want to go ahead and talk about. So nerve cell physiology is really super important so you can understand how nerves communicate with nerves and you can understand how venoms, toxins, poisons, and uh, drugs, how they can actually work on the um, nervous system. So let me talk about resting membrane potential to start us off with. If you take and you stick little electrodes, little voltage meters into the, uh, into the axon or into the cell body of a neuron, you can measure on an oscilloscope, on a computer screen, you can measure that voltage. So if we look at this picture over here, uh, membrane, resting membrane potential is about negative 70 millivolts in this particular cell that we're uh, looking at. So we have the, the, the nerve cells and, and, and cells in the body have the ability to maintain the voltage on the interior of that cell. And, uh, and they, they, they do that, as I'll describe to you in a future uh, slide, um, they do that through having little um, small channels that do different jobs to help regulate the, the, the voltage on the interior. So resting membrane potential is regulated at negative 70 millivolts, and it's accomplished by these little, um, these little channels that are in the membranes of your cells. So some of the players are going to be the sodium-potassium pump, the potassium channels, and the sodium channels. Uh, we call these potassium and sodium channels leak channels. In this particular graphic, you can see the sodium potassium pump right here. And what it's doing is it will all the time work using ATP, and it'll dump three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium that it brings inside the cell. So the sodium potassium pump is really important in maintaining um, the balance of ions in your cells of your body. If you notice, sodium is more prevalent on the outside of the nerve cells than it is on the in excuse me, than it is on the inside of the nerve cells. Okay, so we have more sodium outside than we have more, um, sodium inside. So another way of stating that is that the extracellular environment has more sodium and the inter intercellular uh, environment has more potassium. Becky's over here trying to steal my drink. So let me try to get my drink over here. I'll set a little place up for her to sit. Okay, you can sit over there. So that's real important to have the balance of the uh, of the ions so that you have more sodium on the outside than you have uh, on the inside. Now on the flip side of that, we do have more potassium on the inside than we have on the outside. So if you notice, potassium is more prevalent on the inside than it is on the outside. Okay, so these leak channels how in the sodium potassium pump, how in the world do they maintain negative 70 millivolt charge? Well, you can see that you have many more potassium leak channels than you do sodium leak channels. These potassium leak channels are going to leak more positive charge out than, than positive charge that's leaking in. You can also notice that more positive charge leaves than positive charge comes in. Sodium leak channels are, are not as leaky as potassium leak channels are. So, so because we have leakier and more um, potassium leak channels, more potassium is leaking to the outside than it is coming on the inside, than positive charge coming inside through the less um, sodium channels. So, um, and at sodium potassium pump, notice it's always giving, giving away three positive charge for every two positive charge that come in. So in totality, when you add up all of these things working together, we get that negative 70 millivolt resting membrane potential. That occurs in all the cells of your body, and we like that negative 70 millivolts because that allows the cells to function normally, allowing you know ions to come in at a normal rate, water to come in at a normal rate, so that, that's all good and fine. And there's a little uh, video that you can look at if you'd like to see the leak channels working, but you can do that on, the own, on your own. 
What's, uh, what's kind of cool about a lot of different kinds of cells is they have the ability to change that voltage. So that negative 70 millivoltage, that second seven, negative 70 millivolts, that can actually change. We can depolarize the cell, that is we can cause it to become more positive, or we can hyperpolarize the cell or make it more negative. So we can do different kinds of things because we have the ability to change the voltage. What allows us to change that voltage will be various kinds of, of uh, gated channels. So we have chemically gated ion channels. These chemically gated ion channels, they have receptors on them. If something touches that receptor, then maybe it opens or closes one of those gates. That can allow for ions to flow through. So we can change um, the membrane resting potential. We can cause it to become more negative or cause it to become more positive by uh, by little neurotransmitters touching receptors for these chemically gated ion channels. But we also have voltage gated ion channels too. So in response to change in voltage, so for example if I make the voltage on the interior positive where it was negative before, we can allow ions to flow through. If I take and cause it to be negative, then it, changes, it basically shuts the gate down. So we have voltage gated ion channels. So we can stimulate with drugs or with other kinds of uh, venoms or toxins. We can stimulate uh, the membrane to depolarize, that is, become more positive. We can use drugs and things to stimulate the resting membrane potential to be hyperpolarized or become more negative. Okay, so this is how drugs work and, and how venoms and toxins work. They can cause depolarizations to occur or they can cause hyperpolarizations, but they can change the membrane resting potential from negative 70 millivolts. Well, there are some different kinds of potentials. We have graded potentials and we have action potentials. A graded poten potential is a short-lived localized change in the membrane potential. It's uh, stronger, uh, it, the stronger the stimulus, the more the membrane um, um, voltage changes will occur. So you can have stronger stimuli that allow for stronger graded potentials, or you can have weaker stimuli that, that allow for weak graded potentials. These things are short-lived. Um, they're typically localized, and uh, they occur on the neuron cell body. If we're talking about neurophysiology. So here is just showing you if we have a small stimulus, we can have a localized graded potential where you have a little bit of a change of voltage on the interior to be in positive. And uh, where you have the active area of depolarization, you have a, a little bit of a positive charge that will result. Um, notice that this charge doesn't spread too far away from where you stimulated it. So the distance is very, very weak or very, very localized. It doesn't spread very far. And the voltage, depending upon how much you stimulate it, the voltage can be very uh, minimal in change or it can be really uh, a high change in voltage um, or a change into becoming more positive depending upon how much you stimulate it. So you can have uh, these small deviations in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this membrane potential. So you can see that if I stimulate it here and, uh, and, uh, and allow some of the sodium to flow in, I can take, take and change the, the voltage ever so slightly. If I have more stimulation or great stimulation, I can stimulate it a little bit more. Um, so and this is just showing that you could uh, stimulate it to become negative as well. And I'll show you how that works later on. So this, uh, these little, um, these little uh, um, uh, changes in membrane potential, um, they can be changed because of mechanically gated ion channels. So if uh, a pressure is applied to these mechanically gated channels, then you can see that the ions flow in, and I can change the potential, the membrane potential. Uh, sometimes if I want to stimulate it in a positive way and have a depolarization in a positive way, I can take and use neurotransmitters there and they will open up an ion channel and allow for sodium to flow in. But I also can negatively affect this so I can hyperpolarize 
by certain neurotransmitters and they will actually send in a negative negatively charged ion and, and hyperpolarize so I can have depolarizing um, potentials and I can have hyperpolarizing potentials of the membrane. Now the amplitude of the graded potential depends on the stimulus strength. So if I take a look here, if I just have one stimulus, I have a very small change in membrane potential. If I have multiple stimuli in sequence, I can actually change and depolarize it even more. If I have a third stimulus, I can take and continue to increase the amount of the change in membrane potential. Graded potentials can add together to become larger in amplitude. So if I take one stimulus, it provides this particular amount of membrane potential change. If I add stimuli, though, I can begin to, to uh, cause them to cause a greater amplitude in that, um, in that membrane potential. Notice if I stop stimuli, I go back to resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. Okay, well, I can also have action potentials as well. Action potentials are a very strong depolarization. Uh, it also has in sequence a repolarization, and it has in sequence a hyperpolarization. So if I graphically look at an action potential, it has a depolarization, a repolarization, a hyperpolarization, and then it goes back to resting membrane state. Let's see if I can get my eraser to work here. All right. So this occurs along uh, an axon, and it also can occur on the sarcolemma of muscle cells. So we're talking about action potentials occurring on axons. Graded potentials will occur on the, um, on the cell body of, an ac of a nerve cell. Uh, action potentials are, can be very strong, and they can be transmitted for very long distances across the cell membrane or across the axon membrane. So this shows you an action potential and uh, you can see the action potential is a sequence. So our first action potential occurs right here and you can see sodium floods in. The second action potential is triggered from that first action potential and the first action potential is going through here a repolarization, so going back to negative. The third action potential is triggered by the second action potential. And you can see sodium flowing in, and you can see the potassium uh, is flowing out uh, in that, where that second action potential was. That allows for a repolarization to occur. So essentially, an action potential starts. Action potential starts here, next action potential, next action potential, next action potential, next action potential. So it flows all the way down. These action potentials flow all the way down until they get to the synaptic knob at the very end. So let's talk about the steps to an action potential. So we want to see how an action potential is going to, uh, to work. So an action potential is going to have a resting state. That's where we're going to have sodium channels and potassium channels. These are going to be closed. And what I'm talking about are voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium channels that are going to be closed at resting state. At resting state, we have the negative 70 millivolts. That negative 70 millivolts is being maintained because you have sodium leak channels, potassium leak channels, and a sodium-potassium pump that are all working together to, um, to provide that negative 70 millivolts. But I can open up, if I change the voltage, I can open up these voltage-gated sodium channels and these potassium-gated sodium channels, potassium-gated channels. Um, I can open these up um, if I need to do that. So in a depolarization, a stimulus is going to uh, uh, cause the voltage-gated uh, gated channels to open up, and it allows sodium to flow into the cell. And as that sodium flows in, the voltage becomes po more and more positive, going from negative 70 millivolts to being more positive. So I can have a stimulus. That stimulus can be a drug. That stimulus can be a graded potential that uh, is strong enough to send an action potential down the length of the axon. So during the rise of the action potential, 
we're going to see that the sodium is going to be flowing in and it makes the inside of the membrane positive with, with respect to the outside. I'll graphically will show you all those parts in just one second. The falling of the action potential is where you have sodium channels that are going to close and voltage gated potassium channels are going to open. This causes the inside to become negative because the potassium channels are causing potassium to go from the inside of the, of the nerve cell to the outside. If those potassium uh, channels remain open for a period of time, they are going to cause the um, inside of the cell to become um, more uh, uh, negative. So eventually the potassium cells will, uh, potassium uh, voltage-gated potassium channels will close and they will allow the, um, the cell to go back to resting state potential. So let's take all those words we just described and uh, put them into, into some kind of uh, visual display for you. So here we have resting state potential. That's where the voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated uh, potassium channels are closed. We have the leak channels open, so the, the, the potassium leak channels, sodium leak channels, and uh, pot sodium potassium pump are, are all working to maintain negative 70 millivolts. If I have a stimulus that comes in, I can take that stimulus and, and, uh, and, uh, and open up a, 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 a flood the cell with enough sodium to meet a threshold amount of voltage change to allow voltage-gated sodium channels to open. If so, uh, sodium uh, voltage-gated sodium channels open, you have a rise in the action potential. You have a rise in the, the, the changing of the voltage to positive. If I close those sodium channels, so if sodium channels close and I open up voltage-gated potassium channels, potassium starts to leak out of the cell, which potassium is positive, so you leak negative, you leak positive charge out of the cell and the action potential begins to drop. That is, the, the voltage changes and becomes negative. If I keep those voltage-gated potassium channels open for a longer period of time, more positive charge will drop and you'll drop below negative 70 millivolts. Now eventually those voltage-gated potassium channels will close and then you'll get all of the leak channels and sodium potassium pump. They will go back to working and, and go back to maintaining negative 70 millivolts. So just to show you a little bit more here, when those voltage-gated sodium channels begin to work, sodium floods the interior of the cell, thus causing the charge to become positive. When the voltage-gated potassium channels open up and work, potassium is going to leave the cell and it's going to cause the um, cell to become more negative because you're losing positive charge. There's lots of different ways you can look at this. Uh, you can even go to YouTube and watch little video clips on this as well. But uh, I kind of like this particular graphic here because it shows the, uh, the resting state potential. So here it has resting state potential. And it shows you that the voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels, those channels are closed when you have resting state, um, resting state potential. Remember that the sodium leak channels, potassium leak channels, and sodium potassium pump are maintaining the negative 70 millivolts. Step two, if we have some kind of a stimulus that's applied here that allows some positive charge to flow in, then if we change the charge and we get it to uh, that negative 50 millivolts, then we can activate those um, sodium channels. So if we activate sodium channels, the sodium from the outside starts to flood to the interior and we begin to have a rise in the action potential. If we open up all the voltage-gated sodium channels, then we get a lot of sodium flowing in and we get a rise in the action potential. When we take and, uh, and shut down the voltage-gated sodium channels, and we open the voltage-gated potassium channels, notice that positive charge is no longer flowing in, but positive charge is flowing out, and that's going to cause a repolarization to occur. So we're going from being positive to becoming negative again. That's called repolarization. And if those potassium channels 
remain open, those voltage-gated potassium channels remain open for a period of time, we will get a hyperpolarization that will occur. That is, we'll go below negative 70 millivolts. When we shut down all of the channels, all of these voltage-gated channels, then the sodium leak channels, potassium leak channels, and sodium potassium pump, they go back to working and they will cause negative 70 millivolts to be reestablished. So this is a pretty amazing process that we have these voltage-gated channels that can open and close and, uh, and that they uh, allow for this to occur. You might ask yourself, well, what causes a sodium channel to occur? Well, a sodium channel will, once the voltage activates, the sodium channel will open up and then automatically, within a short period of time, automatically shut down. So um, what causes the potassium channel to do the same thing? This potassium channel, when the voltage changes to being negative on the in, uh, positive on the inside, those, vol those voltage-gated potassium channels will open up. They just open up slower than the voltage-gated sodium channels. Okay, so these things work um, uh, automatically. And again, it's just showing you one more time. Here we have resting state where all your channels are closed. Depolarization is where your voltage-gated sodium channel opens up. Repolarization is where your voltage-gated sodium channel closes, but voltage-gated potassium channel opens up, allowing positive charge to flow out. And then hyperpolarization is just where you continue to keep that opened up until it shuts down. So we can see the action potential coming through. So if we take a look at... Um, at putting a, mol a voltmeter right there, you can see it's at negative 70 millivolts. As the action potential spreads down the axon and goes past that voltmeter, you can see a um, positive charge flowing in. As it continues on, you can see the negative charge being reestablished. And uh, that only takes, you know, somewhere in the order of, you know, less than five milliseconds to occur. I do expect you to be able to draw the action potential. So make sure that you practice, you know, drawing this. Make sure you know what the x axis is. So we have time in milliseconds. So you know, it takes you know somewhere in the order of four to five milliseconds. And we have membrane potential in millivolts on the y axis. Be able to draw all aspects of that. So we have to have a threshold in order for these action potentials to occur. If you don't meet that threshold of um, somewhere around negative uh, 50 millivolts, then, um, then you won't be able to send an action potential. If the stimulus is strong enough to go beyond, um, to cause a, a charge change um, beyond uh, negative 50 millivolts, an action potential will be created. Okay, so as long as you have a stimulus that's, um, that's strong enough to allow some positive charge to flow in, you're going to have action potentials that are going to be sent. So you can have weak stimuli that only send one action potential. You can have really strong stimuli that can send lots and lots of action potentials. So um, in this particular graphic here, it's showing you that you have to have a stimulus for an action potential to, um, to be sent. So an action potential in a myelinated and non-myelinated nerve cell actually occur in different kinds of ways. In a non-myelinated axon, you have to send action, the action potential has to be sent down the whole length of the axon. So all of these voltage-gated sodium channels have to open up for the message to be sent down. In a myelinated um, nerve cell, the voltage-gated uh, sodium channels are really only in the in the areas where the nodes of Ranvier are. So if we take a look here, you have the myelin sheath, that's the Schwann cell or oligodendrocytes that are wrapped around the axons, and only in the gaps do you have the sodium channels. So when you send a an action potential down the length of an axon that has the insulation, only the sodium channels in between the gaps are going to open up. So you get a jumping of the action potential from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier or from gap to gap. So this makes your um, signaling go much more rapidly than if you have to open up every single voltage-gated sodium channel along the length of the axon. 
So these may send a message at maybe two miles per hour. These may send a message at 200 to 300 miles per hour. So having the voltage gated sodium channels only in the gaps makes the message go much more rapidly. So you can see here you have uh, the, the message is sent in little spurts. This is called saltatory um, conduction. And if you take a, a look at this little graphic here in sequence, we have essentially the voltmeters are spread out through here. And you can see that the sodium is flowing in where you have non-myelinated parts. And so if I just take a look at the sequence here, if you take a look at the sequence here, I go from node of Ron VA, the little thing will jump to node of Ron VA, and then it'll go to the next node of Ron VA. So let me just back that up again so you can see that. So notice the voltmeters. Negative, uh, it's positive 30 there, negative 70 there, negative 70 there. So as the action potential spreads, so you go from node of Ron VA, it spreads under, it spreads through the axon underneath the insulation. It then goes to the next node of Ron VA, so you get the voltage gated sodium channels opening up there, and then it spreads to the next one. Because of those little jumps, those little jumps, the message can go very, very rapidly. So if you take and destroy this insulation in a, in a disease like multiple sclerosis, then you go from sending a message at 300 miles per hour to sending a message at two miles per hour, and that doesn't work at allowing nerves to work at the, at the speed that they need to. So this is just showing you the continuous conduction versus saltatory conduction. In, con in continuous conduction, you have the voltage-gated sodium channels all have to open up along the length of the nerve cell. So it's very slow to occur, and it occurs at, say, 2 miles per hour. But if you do the saltatory conduction, it's only the voltage-gated sodium channels located in between the gaps that are going to open up and so that allows you to jump from node of Ron VA to node of Ron VA and that speeds the conduction very rapidly. Now when you are a baby you know you don't have a lot of myelin it takes time for you to grow myelin and, and part of the learning process learning to control your nerve cells is to uh, as you exercise them and and continue to do uh, and to continue to grow and develop these myelin sheaths will grow and um, allow the cells to work faster and faster and faster. So we don't come out potty trained. You know, you basically have to wear diapers because it takes a while for the myelin to grow. So it takes years for it to grow in some people. And so uh, until that myelin grows, you really won't have uh, strong control over those particular functions. You know, you come out um, not really being able to move your muscles that much. So the myelin has to grow, and as you exercise and grow and uh, develop those functions, the myelin grows more and more. Um, and you can grow new myelin too. So as you learn new tasks and learn to do new things, more myelin will grow. You can grow more dendrites. You can grow more axons. So the physical learning process, it physically takes time to grow more dendrites. It physically takes time to grow more axons, and it takes time to grow more myelin. So I don't understand how you can think that you can cram the night before a test and, and how that's going to really uh, allow for you to, to create more myelin and, and, and more dendrites and more axons so that you can physically grow your brain. Um, I know that cramming is easy and it's the, it's the easy thing to do, but when you uh, practice learning, um, over multiple times, over longer periods of time, over days and over weeks. This is when learning really sticks um, and, and uh, becomes meaningful to you. So cramming, you can maybe remember a few things the next day, but when you go to take the final exam, how are you really going to remember stuff if you've crammed it in and you didn't have growth of the dendrites and axons and myelin? Um, if you play an instrument, you know all about growing myelin and growing dendrites and axons because the first time you play a new piece, 
you you know it seems very clunky to you and then after you practice it over and over and over and over eventually you memorize it and uh, that's because you've had growth of the myelin the axons and the dendrites well there's different ways that neurons can contact other neurons we can have neurons that will contact dendrites so you can see this neuron here is contacting this next neuron through an axodendritic connection. So sometimes nerve cells will contact the cell body of other nerve cells, and that's called axosomatic synapse. These are called axosomatic somatic synapses. And then sometimes the nerve cells will exhibit um, control or influence over the axonal hillock, which you see right here. And these are called axoaxonic synapses. This is a very powerful synapse. Okay, these are uh, a little bit weaker down here. So when you look at a nerve cell, um, when you look at a nerve cell connecting to other nerve cells, typically it's not one nerve cell connecting to one nerve cell, but you have lots of nerve cells um, that are trying to exhibit influence over another nerve cell. So we can see that all of these nerve cells, these neuron 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, these are all trying to exhibit inf uh, to, to uh, influence um, this particular nerve cell right here. Okay, so they all send signals to that nerve cell. And it's, you know, some of the nerve cell signals are going to be inhibitory, and some of the nerve cells are going to, uh, to actually be stimulatory. So we can see here that these are stimulatory nerve signals and these are inhibitory nerve signals. Now all of these things are sending signals to this nerve cell and it's going to be a, 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 you know, a summation of uh, are all of them telling this nerve cell to fire an action potential or are all these nerve cells telling them to not send an action potential? Okay, so it's a battle between these nerve cells. So sometimes the inhibitory nerve cells will work and an axon won't send a signal. Sometimes all the excitatory nerve cells will have a greater influence and it will cause so much greater potential to occur in the cell body here in the axonal hillock that eventually an action potential will be fired. Okay, so there is a battle of wills there. I will tell you that these nerve cell, these, these, these different connections over here and over here, um, will, you know, they are powerful and they do send signals. They do help to form a greater potential on the axon, um, the axon's body, excuse me, the, the cell's body. But these ones down here that are influencing the axonal hillock, these have really great influence because the signal that's going to cause a firing of the action potential is going to be generated here. The greater potential has to occur right here that eventually sends uh, the message to send a full-blown action potential down the axon. So these can be very, these can ex exert a little bit greater influence than um, than the axonal dendro, the, the exo exodendritic or exosomatic um, potentials. Well. You know, we have talked when we did the nerve, uh, the muscle cell. We did talk about how um, how an, a synaptic knob at the very end, how this can communicate information to the next cell downstream. So the message comes this way. There are voltage-gated sodium channels that are opening up. Eventually, they open up uh, ca calcium channels. Calcium channels opening up will cause the synaptic vesicles to dump neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Those neurotransmitters will transmit across through diffusion, and they're going to find uh, a receptor um, that will open up a channel or close a channel, depending upon the type of neurotransmitter that it actually is. Okay, so we talked about this before. Go back and look at your muscle cell notes so you can see the voltage-gated um, sodium channels opening up, eventually opening up the voltage-gated calcium channels, causing the synaptic vesicles to fuse, dump their neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft, and then have their activity on the other side when they open or close um, a channel on the other side. Sometimes neurotransmitters will uh, cause um, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. That is, sometimes they'll stimulate the next uh, cell downstream 
to, uh, to, to flow with positive charge and become excited. Sometimes, though, there are neurotransmitters that cross the synapse that are going to be inhibitory, and they will cause an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, and they will cause a hyperpolarization to occur, or they will open up channels to cause negative charge to flow in. Sometimes they will cause um, negative channels to open up. Sometimes they will cause um, potassium channels to open up. They will take the potassium from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, thus causing a negative charge to form because you're losing positive charge. Okay, so that can happen inside, and in, in, uh, that can happen to the next cell. So the next cell can be excited or can be inhibited based on the collection of all these cells and what they tell the cell to do. So here we can see that this cell is sending an inhibitory signal. This cell is sending an excitatory signal. This is sending a, a, uh, an inhibitory signal. This is sending an excitatory signal. So if you have more excitatory than inhibitory, then an action potential will be sent down the axon. If you have more inhibitory than excitatory, then you, then you will get uh, a signal that will be, if you send more inhibitory, then the signal will be inhibited. There will be no action potential. There are many different kinds of neurotransmitters, as you can see in this little graphic here. Uh, I think we have close to more than uh, you know, 80 neurotransmitters that have been described so far, and there are still some that we don't know about. But the one that we talked mainly about has been acetylcholine. But we will talk about a little bit norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, histamine, uh, glutamate or GABA, a, a glutamate and GABA. There's also one called substance P. There's all kinds of natural painkillers called endorphins. And there's even gases such as nitric oxide that acts as a neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitters can have direct effects. That is, the neurotransmitter can bind with a receptor and open up a channel. So you can see here it touches the channel, opens it up, allows the positive charge to flow in. And a couple of neurotransmitters that work in this way will be acetylcholine, uh, the glutamate, and uh, asper uh, aspartate. Some neurotransmitters, though, have what we call indirect effects. That is, the neurotransmitter doesn't touch the actual channel that's going to open or close, but it touches what we call a G protein, which is going to activate an enzyme, which will activate or create what we call a second messenger. That second messenger will go over and it will cause the opening of this particular channel. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, and GABA, these are neurotransmitters that will use an indirect effect. The neurotransmitter will touch a receptor. That receptor will activate a G protein, activate an enzyme, adenylate cyclase in this example, um, and that will uh, cause a second messenger to be formed, which will then go and open the channel. So, and we also have the ability, so, and, and so, let me, let me erase this real quickly so I can say one last thing there. So, um, we can also have neurotransmitters that will cause channels to close as opposed to open. So, if we go here to, um, to this particular graphic, we can see that there also are direct effects that can be, um, let me go back. I'm sorry. That we can we, we can go to this one here. There are uh, neurotransmitters that are going to be gaseous in nature, and these will enter in and uh, will cause the activation of enzymes, which will activate the second messengers that will open or close a gate. So uh, we do have gases, carbon monoxide and, and carbon dioxide. Excuse me, carbon monoxide and nitric nitric oxide are gases that can um, alter th these enzymes. Well, I guess kind of to wrap things up, we'll talk about neural circuits for a second. So a neural circuit is a functional group of neurons that process specific types of information. We can have neurons that are in series. We can have them diverging, converging, reverberating, and or, or parallel after discharge. Let me show you what those look like. So these circuits are collections of nerve cells. And you can see in a divergent circuit, we have the input coming in, and then it begins to diverge 
and then diverges further, so the output's there. Converging, or where you have multiple nerve cells sending information to one cell, that's a converging circuit. We have reverberating circuits, where we have here we have the input coming down, the output comes back, and is going to influence um, the circuit. And then in parallel, after discharge, so here we have we have the inputs coming down, and we have parallel circuits working with the mainline circuit. So um, this is very complex stuff, you know, trying to figure out how how brain cells create music and how brains create speech. You know, it's all because of collections of circuits working together. So there are many different kinds of circuits that work together to perform all the behavior that we have. Um, so, you know, the nervous system exhibits some plasticity. There is some area, there are some areas of, of nerve tissue that do regenerate, uh, do, that do grow and regenerate themselves and grow new neurons. Uh, the hippocampus, uh, part of the brain that's involved in memory, is a place where you have nerve cells that actively grow and divide. Most of the place in the nervous system, though, um, nerve cells and brain cells are not going to grow and divide. Um, they're they're going to grow, but they won't divide um, to to make more of themselves. Plasticity is the uh, is the capability uh, um, uh, to change based on experience. So we do have the ability to grow new nerve cells or to grow more myelin, more dendrites, more axons. Um, and there is some ability to replicate um, some nerve cells in some areas and to repair. So there is uh, some repairability to nerve cells. But generally speaking, if you damage your nerve tissue, that's not going to be good because it's very hard for those things to repair themselves. Generally speaking, the central nervous system has very, very low ability to repair itself. Typically, there's no nerve growth factors that are there. Um, there's very limit that scar tissue will form very quickly, and there's just a limited, limited capacity for it to repair itself. The peripheral nervous system, on the other hand, does have the ability to repair itself as long as the cell body is intact. So if you look at a cell in, a nerve, in the peripheral nervous system, uh, if you damage it, so if I damage this particular part right here, if my cell body is intact, um, I can have little extensions of the axon that will grow out and, uh, and eventually form a new axon. And I have Schwann cells that will wrap around and form a regeneration tube so that I can grow um, and replace those things. But that occurs over long periods of time if it does even occur. So protect your nerve cells and, uh, and uh, because you only get a limited number of them. Um, I did put a little video online there for you. Um, that uh, talks about a very special kind of nerve cell. And I, I really like Ramachandran. He's a great um, um, neurologist. Um, and uh, he's one of my favorite people to, um, to listen to videos of. So listen to a little about Ramachandran and learn a little bit about um, a special kind of nerve cell. Okay, well that completes this uh, particular lecture on nerve tissue. Make sure you look at both halves of it, and if you have questions, please make sure you feel free to email me or see me in class, and I'll get back with you, um, and we can talk about this. So next time we'll talk about a different aspect of the nervous system, so I will see you then.